right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this day, Lord, and for the opportunity to meet together and learn more from Thy Holy Word. We ask for Your blessing on this service, and Lord, that You would encourage us, that we'd leave this place better equipped to serve Thee. In Christ's name, Amen. Well, we're in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter number 5, and just before we get there, I want to... Um, give a little bit of a prologue here for what we're doing because there's a lot of interesting connections. Right at the end of chapter number 4, you find this interesting passage in verse 17. It says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord. Uh, first of all, isn't it nice to see that there is someone that Paul had nurtured and he, he calls him my beloved son. And we, we need to be uh, careful about people around us, people who we can nurture, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, Paul's ways, which be in Christ, that is within the realm of Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so here we see something quite universal about, the, about Paul's ministry at that time. Everywhere, in every church, of course it was important. It was extremely important that people came in contact with this particular apostle. And he says in verse 18, now some are puffed up. Um, and the, the, the Greek word here simply means that, exactly, blown up. <laughs> I was going to draw a picture of something blown up. Um, in New Zealand, of course, there's a lot of uh, agriculture, there's a lot of farming, there's a lot of things going on with the land. And where I used to live in a place called Kumu, the pasture would oftentimes in springtime be very lush. I mean, it was very lush and green, and it would grow a particular grass called clover. There's different types of clover. There's white clover, there's red clover. But any type of clover in the springtime can be disastrous for milk cows. And the reason for this is that they gorge themselves on this stuff and they load their stomachs up with it to the point where the little valves in their stomach start to close off to the gas. So there's a buildup of gas inside their stomach, the valves close off, and, woo, and the poor things get in tremendous pain from this and so the farmers to try and stop this from happening they'll sometimes spray the pasture with some sort of oil and other times it's too late and the cows have what they call bloat and bloat can be disastrous cows if they're not treated will literally blow up they will literally bang and break apart and their stuff will go everywhere and sometimes when it gets really serious the farmer he has a special instrument. He knows exactly where to place it. And he'll push it in the side of the cow, put his hand over it. So he pierces the, the hide of the cow. It goes right in. And he holds his hand over the, the end of this large syringe-like object and whoosh, 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 lets all the gas out. <laughs> and it's pretty, pretty wild stuff. So that's the sort of meaning it has here. They are puffed out. They're blown up as though I would not come to you. These are showing their arrogance to some degree. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. And this business of being puffed up, the power and the word, they're all in here. And you're going to find, as we move into chapter 5, this context go keeps coming in. And it's important you see it, because in the next verse, verse 20, it says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Now, we know that the kingdom has various facets of it. But the point is that these people were moving into the time when the tribulation would come about. It's right on their doorstep. If the nation would repent, then the tribulation period would come on. The phase of the kingdom of God would be power, believe me. Real power, raw power. Uh, and it says, For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. What will ye? What do you wish? What is your wish? What do you wish? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? So what is it they want? There's a choice they're going to have to make. Isn't it interesting he, he talks about the rod? It's a metaphorical rod, but it certainly has a literal uh, application that 
this rod would be used if necessary. And if you look for the, the meaning of the word rod in various contexts, they, it comes up um, in various ways. And I want you to look at this passage with me. It's in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 1. And quite a lot of revelation comes to you as you just see the context of these words and how they fit in with, with the book of 1 Corinthians. It says this in 1 Corinthians 1 verse, uh, sorry, Hebrews 1 verse 8. It says, but unto the Son he saith. So here is the comparison. He's showing how much more the Son excels. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of of thy kingdom. There's the rod. And you notice the, con the context here. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter, the rod of thy kingdom. The same context is actually found here in 1 Corinthians concerning the kingdom. It's not in word, but in power. And uh, going on down a little bit further, if you go across to verse uh, 9, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So here we have got an interesting connection. Verse 8, verse 9. Verse 9, the same personage is, also, is the servant, but he's also the God. In verse 8, O God, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And if you go down uh, to chapter number 9, and let's see, it's around about verse 4, it says this. Um, <clears throat> talking about the uh, holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded. And the tables of the covenants. Again, it's associated with the kingdom. It's Aaron's rod. And certainly that's been in there for some time. Where it is today is an interesting question, which I don't have the answer to. Look at chapter 11. Chapter number 11 and verse 21. It says this. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped. Leaning upon the top of his staff. That's the rod again. He says, blessed both the sons of Joseph. Again, to do with Israel's, Israel's blessings. Then the next time you find it is in the book of Revelation. So all we're doing is we're just sort of looking at passages which have the word rod in. And you get quite a bit of instruction from it. Revelation 2 and verse 27 and it says this, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And he shall rule them. Now, what's this all about? Well, we better back up and get a bit of context. In verse 18, it says, of chapter 2 of Revelation, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. This is looking forward in this vision, and Christ is speaking now to John. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and last to be more than the first, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. And this is typical that you find concerning these churches. Because thou hast sufferest, thou, thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which, is, which calleth herself a prophetess. Notice she calls herself a prophetess. To teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Oh, hold the phone. We've got now a context of teaching, prophetess, fornication. We're getting a similar kind of context in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And it goes on, And I gave her space to repent for her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that committed, commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Again, 
This is looking also in a similar sort of context to 1 Corinthians, where the tribulation is approaching, with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Except they repent of their deeds. So there is an opportunity for repentance and this judgment not come on them. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and, and hearts, and I will come unto every one of you according to your works. Now listen, is this the meek, mild little Jesus that everybody wants to push around? No, it's a very different portrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you agree? This is very different. Paul says, I want to know the power. Not the word, the power. Here we're seeing the power, right? There is an application of power here that man, it's according to righteousness. And man, you don't want to be on the wrong side. Yes, there's grace there. If they repent, even after they've done all these bad things, if you repent, okay. There's a place there for repentance. But unto, this is in verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, this is the doctrine, Right? And which have, have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Here's the coming of the Lord Jesus. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now here's the overcomer given power over the nations. Power. Why, there's a lot of stuff repeating here, contextually, that matches up with what we find in 1 Corinthians. And if you go a little bit further on, um, go across to chapter 11 of Revelation. <clears throat> chapter 11 and verse number 21. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, that is absolutely wrong. It's 11 verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Okay, so here's a reed like a rod, and it's being used to measure. And it's being used to, to measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship in there. Those three. And it says, And the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Well, very definitely, you've got the temple being honored. You've got its measurements being taken with a reed, which is like unto a rod. The kingdom, the reign of Christ, it's all there. The precedence of Israel, it's all implied here. Let's go across to number tw chapter number 12 and verse number 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days tribulation period time of suffering time when they're tested rod is there again now the last passage I want you to take it to is chapter number 19 Chapter number 19 and verse 15, a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not very meek and mild. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There's no doubt about it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he is coming to reign with his rod. Now, what am I pointing out here? Here are the, some of the connections I want you to see in here. That when the apostles came, and chiefly Paul, who says in verse 20 of chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Implied in here is this apostolic authority and the righteousness which is expressed in that rod and man he can use it he'll use it let me show you how often this rod can be used and how powerfully it can be used go back into the book of acts 
chapter number 5. Look at this. Let me show you. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you take passages out of their God-given context, then you may, may try to take to yourself apostolic power that you do not have, and you'll try and subject people to authority that is not germane to this age. Let me show you. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the prize, his wife also being privy to it. She knew about it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Brought a certain part, not the whole shebang. Kept back some of it, right? Just part of it. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? How did he know that? How did he know he was lying? Because he has the gift of knowledge. He was an apostle. He had the gifts of an apostle. And he also had the power of an apostle. And he had the rod of an apostle. And he says, And to keep back part of the price of the land, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Hey, there's no place for repentance even here. Just bang! You say, but, 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 but this is not fear. This is not... It is fear, man. The guy lied. Does that mean to say that he's lost his salvation? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say anything about him losing his salvation. We're going to find the same sort of thing happen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where this person who was taken in, in fornication with his father's wife, that is, uh, adopted mother, he was given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it doesn't mean to say he was lost, but there was certain judgment that would come down on him. And that kind of judgment then, man, could be aggressive. This is pretty aggressive, wouldn't you say? <laughs> man, do you see this kind of punishment going on today? No, you do not. And for someone to try and institute it would be absolutely a breaking of what God has further revealed to us. You say, but it's in the scriptures here. Yeah, it's in the scriptures here, right? But what we need to know is what is it, what are in the scriptures later on after the book of Acts? What we want to know is what's God's food for us. You know the word just came across me as we were singing that song, uh, the Christmas carol, Bethlehem. You know what that word is in Hebrew? Now, I'm not a Hebrew specialist. I'm not going to try and pretend I am. But I do know this Hebrew word. Bethlehem. It means house of bread. House of bread. Bethlehem. The house of bread. Yes. The bread of life. Right? The bread of life. And he'll give life as a gift. But my friends, in this time here, during the book of Acts, if you messed up, you could really mess up. And you go out feet first. Man, feet first. That's pretty rough. You say, no, it, wouldn't ha it happened right here. And it says in verse 5, and Ananias hearing these words, isn't it interesting? Five. Five bleeding wounds he bear, right? Five. Death and grace that go together. If you go to Genesis 5, look for it. And he died. And he died. And he died. And he died. Okay. And it says here, And great fear came on all them that heard these things. You betcha, man. <laughs> oh, man. You betcha. Now, I don't think too many Christians here are overly fearful of lying. I don't think so. I, I, I just don't believe it. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. That was the practice in those days. You don't mess around with dead bodies. You know, in the Western world today, when someone passes on, well, put them in the storage in a cold place in the morgue and put out the ads 
and when enough people arrive, then you go through with the funeral. Why? Because you can, you can cold storage them. But in those t times, no, You've got to get rid of the body quick. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. <laughs> now, there's going to be mercy for her, right? There's going to be mercy. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so, so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. Right then, it's over. Now, if she could, if she just said, Well, actually, no, we didn't, the outcome could have been very different. We don't know, but I would say yes, there would have been a different outcome. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Bingo. <laughs> Finish. Done. End of story. End of Ananias and Sapphira for this life. Gonzo. Does it mean they were lost? No, it doesn't say that. But they did receive judgment. They received the rod. What do we find in the book of Revelation? Same kind of thing, man. You mess around with doctrinal issues, and man, there can be some serious judgment coming down. Real serious. Now go across now with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. I find this interesting. I find it interesting that Christians today walk past these passages and say, well, why aren't these things happening today? Surely you should be looking for an answer to those questions. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number uh, 5, where we've been, and verse number 1. It says it is reported commonly. So 1 Corinthians is like reading in the book of Acts. It's an Acts epistle. Commonly, that there is fornication among you. Pornaya. Pornaya really means any illicit sexual activity. But in this context, it means fornication among you. And such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles. And the Gentiles got up to some pretty wild stuff. But this was pretty bad. That one should have his father's wife. So this, this went on. And ye are puffed up. Same word you find previously in chapter 4. And have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. No, you haven't mourned. He should have been taken away. He should have been removed. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so, so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, bang, there, there's power right there. When ye are gathered together, and my spirit, spirit of Paul, right there, apostolic, right? Apostolic authority, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Here we have it. Don't mess with the apostles in the book of Acts. Don't mess with doctrine. You can mess around with doctrine today, man, and it looks like God is going to let you get away with it, at least for this life. Now, there's going to be a payday later. Salvation is by grace, but there's going to be a judgment. It says, For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Or the Lord Jesus. Now, come across with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What am I doing? I'm laying down the fact that an economy was going on in the book of Acts, which fits with the book of Revelation, which fits for the coming tribulation, which fits for the time then present, but it's different today. It's different today. It's not going on today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at it. Well, this has to do with the Lord's Supper. Now, a lot of people are involved with the Lord's Supper. It says this, uh, verse 26, 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That's his perusa. That's his coming to the earth. That's the doctrinal situation. Till he come. That's the hope that was then present. 
Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Let me take note here. It says, eat, right, this bread and drink. Those are the verbs. Eat and drink. And then it says, unworthily. That's the adverb. Right? So that modifies the verb. So it doesn't say, it does not say that if you're an unworthy person, then this judgment would come on you. No, no, it's talking about the manner in which you are eating and drinking. Not the fact that you're unworthy. We're all unworthy, right? We're all unworthy. But the specific thing that Paul is addressing is the way in which they are eating the, the bread and drinking the cup. And it says, but, verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, repeat it again, same context, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Power, rod, context, acts, tribulation. That's it. Not in word, but in power. That's the context. Look what it says. Verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Lovely. So therefore, if you... Eat and drink this in an unworthy fashion. They get, and Paul gives an example how that can be done. Then there's judgment coming on you. Judgment. In some case, very, very serious Ananias and Sapphira type judgment. Right? Because the sleep here is not this. It's not that. It's dead. D-E-A-D. -E You're dead. That's what it's about. Pretty strong stuff isn't it? Very, very strong stuff. Go back to 1 Corinthians 5. So I think this is an amazing uh, passage like that. It brings out a lot of truths. We have been looking at this whole idea of how Paul uses examples and, and how he would take a, an example which was not really uh, to him, but he changes form. He changes its form so that it can apply and that's an interesting thing that is used in these passages. Um, just let me show you one, one of those red ones here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. A good warning here. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13, it says this. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Interesting here that Paul, in a different context, can transform a situation which was evil into something which could be used for a good purpose. But here in 2 Corinthians 11, we've got ministers who transform themselves and pretend to be angels of light. But in fact, what are they? They're ravening wolves. Just an interesting thing here. Now in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse uh, 16, it says, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. That's what he says. Be ye followers of me. Uh, just before then, he says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Here is Paul setting himself up as a father. Not simply a pedagogos. Why? There's plenty of them. There's plenty of hired helps around who can bring instruction about Christ. Yes, there's plenty of them. There's lots of them today, aren't there? There's lots of instructors in Christ. But there are not many fathers. Not many fathers. Paul was one of the fathers. And he says, I beseech you. Para. Kaleo. I call you parachute. Alongside. I call you alongside. Therefore, I call you alongside. Be ye, be ye imitators of me. Follow it. I don't like translation imitator. Why? Because imitation has the idea of something false. You know, an imitation. What is it? Well, it is a, it is a copy. 
But it's a false thing. It's got, it's got a, there's an idea of falsity in the word imitation. I don't like to use it. I, I would rather say follower, right? Be f- followers of me. I beseech you. Isn't it interesting that he begs them? I call you alongside, therefore. I beg you, be ye followers of me. And that's an interesting thing. And when we see that comparison, you know, that today, you know, people want to go away from the founding fathers. They don't like the founding fathers. Or they want to put the founding fathers into a poor light. Or they try and denigrate them. Yet they are the ones that have laid a great political foundation, a foundation for the United States, which will ensure our freedom and liberty here. People move away from it. Look at the correspondence you can find here with Paul. People are moving away from Paul, aren't they? They move away from especially the special revelation given to Paul the prisoner. And what's, the, what's going to be the result in doing that? Well, there's going to be a whole lot of bad practices just like we've been reading about, where people try and resurrect ideas out of the book of Acts and think that they have apostolic gifts and powers to somehow bring judgment on others. Imagine the pain and suffering that's coming to Christian people because they do not understand the father, Paul, the founding father of our age. And you read, read, for example, during the book of Acts, Paul was instrumental in laying the foundation. He says this in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. You see, there is indeed a founding generation of fathers who laid a foundation for this country. And when people move away from that, what's going to happen? There's going to be bitter fruit, bad fruit coming, my friends. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 again. And it says this in verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Now how could they glory in this? It kind of boggles the mind. Here you have a man who has been involved with an obvious sin. How is it possible that they could glory in such a thing? Well, the only thing that I could possibly come up as an explanation, because it's not directly stated how they're glorying, but one way they could do it is by magnifying God's grace, which Paul certainly hits in the book of Romans. You know, they can magnify, well, look at, it, look at the sin that he's done, but God's grace abounds. See, pervert grace. Take grace and pervert it. They could do something like that. Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's true. The whole lump is that which is needed. Well, that's bread, right? You all done bread, have you? Breads. I used to do a lot of bread. Making my own bread. But it took so much time I stopped doing it. But, man, it's, it's quite fun making bread. You just need a little bit of leaven in there, a bit of yeast. And you put it in there and you got to... You know, knead it, knead it, and you let it rise. And sometimes you have to knead it again and let it rise again. And you cut it up into bits and put a bit of powder over it and put it into a hot oven. And out comes this beautiful smelling bread. But it's only a little leaven that you need. And whoo, it produces the carbon dioxide that makes the bubbles and makes the thing expand out and gives you nice light bread. That's what we use it for. But you only need a little leaven, and it leavens the whole thing. Generally speaking, leaven is put in a bad context. Verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge it out. You see, the feast that was committed to the Egyptians, not the Egyptians, but the Israelis when they left Egypt, was with unleavened bread because it would be made in haste. And if you put yeast in there, it takes a long time. You have to wait for it for, for ages. But this process of leaving Egypt, it was done in haste. And therefore, it was unleavened bread. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. See, as ye are unleavened. Isn't that a, a wonderful thing? Even though Paul hits these Corinthians for all that they've done wrong, yet in Christ, they're unleavened. Even as you're unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Again, 
This is a feast that was given to Israel. Were they to destroy the feast? Well, verse 8 says, Therefore, let us keep the feast. They kept the feast. They kept the feast. But they put on there a new interpretation. The fullness of that shadow, the fullness of that type, came in the person of Jesus. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here it is. And from verses 9 to 13, here you've got a further description of how it is that they could give this person to Satan for the destruction of, flesh, of the flesh. It says here, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for them must ye needs go out of the world. Okay, there are some people who believe, you know, that you've got to be completely separate from the world, and you have nothing to do with anybody in this world, and you only associate with fellow Christians, you only get employed with fellow Christians, and the whole thing, the whole of your life, you live completely with fellow believers. There are people like that. This is a bit of a problem, though, isn't it? Right? This is a bit of a problem to that idea. Because it says, uh, yet not, verse 10, yet not all together, you see, with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortions, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. <laughs> so, you can't do it all together, and you have a function. You, you're an ambassador. You've got to bring the truth of Christ to people. And if people really took this seriously, then there would be no outreach. There's no outreach to anybody. Unless they sort of look, well, that's a strange group over there. I wonder what they're doing. Unless they sort of make interest themselves. And some people even go so, so far as to shun them. So that if they do show interest, you just say, keep away. <laughs> keep away. <laughs> You're a fornicator. You're of this world. We have nothing to do with you. Well, that's not what we find here. And I don't believe that's what God intends at all. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. And that's, that's wonderfully true. I mean, thank God we don't have to do that. Therefore, put away from among, you, among yourselves that wicked person. Judgment, strong, powerful, the rod is there. And God is behind this judgment and in some cases it's very very strong well that's first corinthians chapter five i think there's a lot of instruction in here which shows you that this is clearly not the age in which we are living it's just not are there practical things we can learn from of course there is there's plenty of things that we can learn practically from it but when it comes down to doctrine about how we are to deal with people in this age this is the wrong place to go you'll get the wrong instructions well, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we've had together, all the passages we've read through. We ask, Lord, that You bless each person here as we contemplate, understand, and study. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.